if I should put my glasses on. Hey, welcome to the Glenn Gower Podcast, sponsored by Mission Blueprint, reviving the church. Today, we are talking about the cloud. But which cloud? Is there more than one cloud? It appears so. Now, the first cloud on this story today is the Shekinah, the glory, the presence of God, who is omniscient, ever-loving. If you will, he's a database for all knowledge and all information, the creator of the world, the cloud by day, the fire by night, and the time of the Israelites, the cloud that covered the tabernacle in the Old Covenant, the cloud that blocked Pharaoh and his army. The cloud has a name in Hebrew, Shekinah, which is a visible manifestation of the presence of God. Now, anytime God does something, the enemy counters that. The enemy is Satan. Satan, he ridiculously tries to defeat or destroy the works of God. Let's see here. We have a deity versus an angel. There is no contest. Yet Satan does his best to pull so many people away from God. He mirrors everything. Here's two examples. In the Catholic Church, we have Holy Mass. The Satanists have their own version of their Mass. Here's another example. Catholics have a Madonna. Interesting enough, so do the Satanists. Some of you might think this is a stretch. I don't think it is. If you remember the singer Madonna, one of her first big hit songs is Like a Virgin. And one of the pictures I have recently seen of Madonna is she has a crown uh, with two horns, much like that of Baphomet. Hmm, is that a coincidence, ladies and gentlemen? Now, does Satan have his own version of the cloud? So this might be a stretch, but I don't think it is. Some of you might be thinking, mm, the cloud I'm talking about is the passing on of data, sometimes through radio frequency. The Apple community people call it iCloud. The Google people call it Google Cloud Platform. Microsoft calls it Microsoft Cloud. The internet. Whatever our user is looking for, he can find. It's everything imaginable. So today we welcome back Dennis. The Protestant. The Protestant. <laughs> the Christian Protestant. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. You know, you're talking about these Catholics have their cloud in their tabernacle. I'm like, man, I'm gonna, I got to fight for the Protestants today. We don't have a cloud. Fight for the Protestants. <laughs> you can fight for the Protestants. All right, we'll do that. <laughs> so, uh, hey, you are in D.C., what happened? Oh, wow. Um, well, thank you for doing that. Um, for our listeners, uh, it's open. DC is open. My son and I were there um, Saturday through Wednesday, and we spent the first night on a bus tour, three hours. We hit 11 monuments, no masks, sit and, and enjoy the tour. It was great. Did you have a favorite monument? Oh, hands down, I'm still just a huge fan of the Vietnam Memorial. It's just something somber and real about that and how it was designed and the reflection in it. I was really impressed with the Martin Luther King monument. They had a lot of his great quotes, some of his one-liners from his speeches all over. And hands down, uh, Lincoln. Those, those, those top my top three. That's a great monument. It was. Huge. Yeah. So Sunday, we went up to the National Cathedral. We actually went to church there and uh, participated in the service. And then we got to tour the whole um, enormous structure. It's it's incredible. If you've never been, you've got to go. It's Gothic architecture, high vaulted ceilings, solid stone and marble. It's just beautiful. It's stained glass everywhere. Uh, and then we went out to the National Zoo. We got to see the pandas hung out there. And then we went out to Arlington National Cemetery and mm. spent uh, about three or four hours there. We got to see the changing of the guard at the uh, at the tomb of the unknown soldier. There was also a wreath laying ceremony, which is really special. That only happens every few days. Cool. Uh, and then, um, 
of course, checked out like Iwo Jima's uh, and the Marine Memorial, you know, with them planting the flag in Iwo Jima. Uh, Monday was a huge day as well. Uh, National Holocaust Museum. Now, it was interesting. They're privately run, so they had a mask mandate. So you had to wear a mask when you went in and uh, a little more social distancing. But as soon as we were outside, no worries. We went to the Natural History Museum. No problem. Went to the National Gallery of Art. No problem. Went up to the National Archives and saw the National Constitution or the Constitution and Declaration of Independence. Interesting fact. My son, God bless him, 17 years old, going to graduate uh, here in two months, be 18 in a couple months as well. He can't read cursive. Really? He could not read the U.S. Constitution or the Declaration of Independence because it is all handwritten in cursive. So they're not teaching cursive anymore. They are not. And so he just looked at it and he's like, this could be Egyptian hieroglyphs as far as I know. Really? Yeah. So one of the things I want to urge our listeners is if you have children, please don't let them lose the art of cursive. Think of how many of our historical documents are written in cursive. What's interesting, we watched a video on cursive handwriting and when kids learn cursive, there's more connections made in the brain than just printing out. So there's something about cursive that gets your brain going even further. Well, it makes sense. It's artistic. It flows. It gets the left side of the brain talking yeah. to the right side of the brain. You know, it's it's not linear. Um, so that was really interesting. One of the other things I found really interesting, shout out to Eastern South Dakota, James River to the Minnesota state line. There was a letter written to... Um, President Hoover about Al Capone and it was from school children in Mitchell South Dakota <laughs> on display kidding? at the National Archives that's awesome and it was about not letting Al Capone out of prison interestingly enough you walk back 25 feet and there was this very long neat document from the Homestead Act about how if you were a farmer and you came into the Louisiana Territory that had been purchased and you homesteaded you had 160 acres and you had five years to build a house and to start to cultivate the land and if you could prove that you did that the government gave it to you free and clear there's a letter there from the homestead act of a homestead declaration of the historical aspects of it for a farm in dismit south dakota really from charles Ingles. Get out of here. Yeah. And it was crazy. He built a 12 by 12 foot house in Dismet. He had 32 acres he cultivated. There was two years he was off the farm because he went and worked for the railroad. But he just played it all out in this document. And within 30 feet in this great big building, there were two letters referencing South Dakota. Hmm. It was so cool. It's like way to represent flyover state. That's wonderful. <laughs> he didn't spend much time in Walnut Grove, my friends. No. He really no, didn't. No. He's his, a South Dakota boy. His his stories in South Dakota. Uh, then then we after we wrapped up there, we went over to the International Spy Museum where we Ooh. got uh, got to be incognito. We got to pick out identities, secret identities, and we um, toured that, which was awesome if you get the chance to be there. And then Tuesday, we spent the entire day up on Capitol Hill. We got to meet with John Thune and his staff. We got to meet with Mike Rounds and his staff. Um, Dusty Johnson was late getting back from being here in South Dakota, so we didn't get to meet him. They gave us an opportunity to come back and see his office about 5.30, but we were already on for supper plans. So um, that was pretty much wrapped up our trip. Well, it's great to have you back. Hey, thanks, man. So today, an interesting topic. So clouds. I picked, yeah, I picked a, a, you know, the cloud topic. Mm -hmm. Now, where did this come from? 30 years ago, I had a dream. And I'll call it a prophetic dream. For those listening, discern. I think God gave me this dream. And uh, here go. so here's the dream. In the dream, I was sleeping in my farmhouse. It was an August evening, hot. It was just after harvest. I wake up around midnight and I look towards the west out my window. I sleep in the upstairs. In the dream, I was in my bed. And there's hundreds of people in my yard. And it's like a huge party. 
Well, anyway, I pay attention and and I notice immediately that they're all looking up in the sky. And there's all these fancy um, images, sort of like the Siri, you know, when you say, hey, Siri on your phone. It's sort of like that. And that was dancing all over the sky. And everybody was going, Ooh, ah, oh, and they're, wow, that's so cool. Because they'd never seen anything like that before. A little bit like the Northern Lights, but way better or way different. So I also was caught up in this uh, viewing, looking up in the sky. And then I heard Jesus say my name. He said, Glenn. I turned to him, which really was looking east. And I woke up. Well, now and then I would ask him as I'm praying, what was I seeing? Now, ladies and gentlemen, this dream happened in 1990. Okay? For better context. And in my prayer time throughout the years, I would ask him, Lord, what was that? And he wouldn't say anything. Lord, what was that? And, you know, every four years, maybe every six years, what was that? He didn't say anything. So I dropped it. Well, around five years ago, I was doing morning prayer downstairs in the basement. And um, the dream came up. He reminded me of the dream. So I asked him, Lord, what was that? And he said, the cloud. And I went, oh, the cloud. Oh, the cloud, the internet-based cloud. That's what everyone was looking at. So at the Revival Conference, we talked about this, the cloud. And there really is two versions of the cloud. God's presence. Some call it, the, the Hebrews call it the Shekinah, the glory cloud. It manifested God and himself, his presence, his glory. Um, cloud by day, fire by night. But this whole, another version, Satan's version, the internet, the cloud. Now, let me just give you a couple disclaimers. I'm not saying the internet is evil in of itself, but it could be used that way. I'm not saying these phones are evil in themselves, unless you have a droid. Um, who would want a droid? Maybe they are, but no, I'm not saying they're evil in themselves. Uh, when it comes to idols, anything can be an idol, right? Right. Basketball can be an idol. Um, farming can be an idol. Anything, anything can be an idol. A brand can be an idol. I got caught up in Apple um, 20 years ago. And it was so fascinating. Every year, the stuff they'd come up with, especially when the iPhone came out. I was looking at Apple rumors all the time. What's coming up? What's coming up? What's coming up? And my all my time was going there. So I just want to clarify, anything can be an idol. And all of us have to be careful. So, Dennis, I want to bring you in for some initial thoughts so far. Any questions you may have about my dream or what I'm talking about? No, I I love this this concept because, again, you're getting into the techie side of things that I like. And I've always laughed about the the cloud being your source of security. Because at its very basis, a cloud is wispical, it's constantly changing, and it can disappear in a minute. And we're going through some of our, our schooling with our son, and he's learning about weather. And we, we've just been talking about how electricity and lightning form in a cloud. And it's it, I just love this topic. So I'm very fascinated by your, your premonition, your your prophetic dream as to where that plays into our current conversation. So let's go back to the old covenant, which is the same thing as to say the old Testament. Testament. Moses is really the second great prophet. Abraham's the first Moses, maybe the greatest prophet of the old Testament. Really? You know, lots of people give David accolades. David did great things. He killed so many people and he's, he has blood everywhere, including his kid, right? Now he himself didn't kill his kid, but his kid came after him. Read that in the Bible. Moses is a type of Jesus. He just is, right? He leads the Israelite people out of Egypt. They had been there 430 years. They, the Israelites got there because Joseph's brothers sold him to the Ishmaelites into slavery. So Joseph ends up in Egypt and he's a slave and he rises a little bit, then finds himself in jail 
And then uh, he starts interpreting dreams. So here we are now, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about dreams again. So uh, Joseph interprets a baker's dream and a cup server's dream. And he's accurate. And he told the cup server, that's not the right term, but anyway, who he's the guy who hands the pharaoh his cup to drink. They had one guy for that job. That's my son. He's the... You know, <laughs> he's, the, he's the barista. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he got both of those dreams. They each had a dream and he uh, interpreted the dreams. Joseph interprets the Pharaoh's dream. And what does the Pharaoh do? He makes him second in command. So Joseph is now he's going to save the Egyptians in the world. So they had seven great promising years of crops and they stored a lot of grain in the bins. And they took, I believe, one-fifth from each uh, farmer and stored it in the bins. And then when the seven bad years came, they they were able to proportion it out and basically save everyone. Um, so that's how they got there. Joseph's brothers came to get grain, and then Joseph reveals himself because his, brother, his brothers betrayed him. Well, Moses pulls those people out of slavery. They become slaves to the Pharaoh, which the Pharaoh, um, if you want to think of a metaphor, you think Pharaoh is Satan, right, in the story. He's really the bad guy. Moses takes the people out. Uh, the 10 plagues are the 10 gods that the uh, Egyptians worshipped. So he uses the gods against them to show them there's no power in these gods, especially in the the apex is Pharaoh himself, his firstborn son, right? The sun god, Ra, uh, the firstborn son dies. See, there's no power in you humans. I've got all the power, God says, basically. And through Moses, he, Pharaoh says, get out of here. And so you see the appearance of this cloud when Pharaoh uh, begins attacking the Israelites a day later after he realizes he should have never let the Israelites go. So he goes after them, and then you, you see this cloud by day, fire by night and it actually blocks Pharaoh's army from the Israelites and so the Israelites are now crossing the Red Sea and it blocks them and then it allows the uh, Pharaoh and his army to go after them on the Red Sea floor and then the waves crush in so you see this cloud this glory cloud God's presence um, in the old covenant this might be a shocker to you why is that I've seen the glory cloud before back in 1990 Okay. Yeah. And lots of people don't know this because I don't talk about it. Okay. And lots of people say, well, Glenn, you're schizophrenic. Are, are you going to go there today? Yeah. Just for just for a titch. Just for a little bit. Okay. I may talk about it more later on. Okay. But in my search for God in 1987 or 1988, um, I needed to know if God was real. I just needed to know. And so uh, my girlfriend told me that Mary, the mother of God, is literally appearing in Europe. And I thought, well, if that's true, then there must be a God. I thought there was probably a God, but I wasn't sure. Agnostic would be my disposition. Okay. So um, to make a long story short, I realized God was real. I went on a retreat. I knew intellectually he was real. Uh, I was actually doing St. Thomas Aquinas. He has five proofs that God is real. I didn't know anything about him, but I did at least three of those proofs in basic training. Where do those thoughts come from, right? The Holy Spirit was feeding me those thoughts. I gave my life to Christ in 1990 as a Roman Catholic. Um, I wanted out of the Roman Catholic Church. I was on my way out. And I had good reason to leave, right? Okay. But uh, the Lord wanted me to... St he gave me permission to stay. He told me if you wanted to go, I could go. But I found truth in the Roman Catholic Church. So I gave myself to Christ January of 1990. I fell into a pit of sin six weeks later. Did it take... Well, it did, but I still didn't know him. See, that was the problem. On March 25th, on the Feast of the Annunciation in the Catholic Church of 1990, I had three people pray over me. Now, this is not typically your Catholic thing, right? But it's Way more Protestant thing. Yeah, but in Aberdeen, South Dakota, it definitely was a Catholic thing. Well, welcome to the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> so they laid hands on me. And my body started to literally shake. It was the Holy Spirit of God moving in my through my baptism. Well, whether he's coming from above and hitting me or coming from within, I, I'm not going to choose either side, probably both. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But when I, I had my eyes closed for the first several minutes, but when I opened my eyes, 
literally there was a cloud in the room. I could, I was the only one that could see it. Now, for you listeners, you're probably going to say, I'm done with him. So be it. I'm not going to deny what I saw. What did I see? Somehow I knew with 100% certainty that was God. That was his presence, his glory. And nobody can talk me out of it. Now, if you don't believe me, fine. But that was 30 years ago, 32 years ago, and I'm still going strong here. I mean, look at my life's work. Don't look at my sinfulness, but look at what I've done. I've stayed as a Catholic evangelist the whole time. And I've never backed down. I've seen that glory cloud twice. Other people have seen it. Now, I'm not the only one. Other people saw it when I was in Aberdeen on a search retreat. I was um, doing what is called prayer backup. And we asked the Holy Spirit through Our Lady's intercession to come. There's a few of us that saw the cloud in the room. I saw it again. I've only seen it twice. So I know personally, I don't need the church to tell me that it's real. I experienced it. I know not a lot of Catholics or not a lot of Christians have experienced that, but I have heard stories of other Christians experiencing that as well. Sure. So uh, I wanted to talk about the cloud today because you can get caught up in two clouds for sure. Now, my heads have been literally or metaphorically or both <laughs> in the clouds. In the clouds. In the cloud. Right. Um, so going to this dream I had, there was no such thing as the cloud yet, or it existed, but nobody knew about the cloud. So in 2017, 2016, when I had that dream, I went, oh, oh, oh my gosh. People are in the cloud constantly. You know, I am. You know, we can be, we can live in this world, but not of it, right? Correct. That's what I try to do. Mm hmm so I wanted to bring you in because... So, so do you feel like go ahead. in that dream, God was trying to get you to turn away from that whirly, swirly cloud out your west window and to turn towards him and his his essence? Tell me a little more yes about that. Yes and no. I think what Jesus was trying to tell me is a plethora of people. Do you like that word? I like, I like plethora. Three Amigos? Yes. Oh, I love that movie. A plethora of people, a lot of people are going to be caught up in the cloud and their eyes are going to be off of me. Part of my job is to not only share that dream, but say, hey, take a step back. Have you ever heard of Simon? I'm going to script his last name. Simon Sinek? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. I watch a few of his videos. I really like him. Yeah. But he has... Find your why. Yeah, he's a very... He has a very commonsensical approach to things. Yes. Giving talks. and Yes. But one of the things he said is, we don't know how to communicate anymore. He said, so when my friends and I, when we go out, we go out to eat together, everybody leaves their cell phone, but one, so we can enjoy each other's company. Because what happens when you, um, Dennis, what happens when you go home for family reunions? Or what happens when you go out and eat with people? Or what happens if you are in social gatherings oftentimes? What happens? Well, the rule is, is within seven minutes... Unless the conversation is really engaging, you will seek out your own individual thoughts or daydreaming. Or in our cases, a lot of time with our young people, they'll just get into their phone and they'll start looking for things. Last night we had our our season-ending volleyball game. So the the spring volleyball season's over. We we didn't do as well as we had planned. Dang it! But we went in for a, a consolatory beverage. Um, there you go. At a local establishment. And there's six of us on the team. See, you'd be a good Catholic. <laughs> Some Protestants don't do the drinking thing, but you'd be a good Catholic. Anyway, keep going. Uh, so we were sitting there, and we have two young ladies on our on our volleyball team. Mm -hmm. And the four of us men are a little bit older, and the gals are a little younger. And within five minutes of sitting at the table, they're both on their phones. And with the one gal, she was like, oh, I'm just talking to my parents. I'm like, but aren't you here right now? Like, don't you want to talk to us? What'd they say? And she was like, she was like kind of a jaw drop. And was like, oh, yeah, you're right. But she's 20. And it's so common in her demographic. This is just what you do. It's, it's not considered rude. It's not considered um, offensive to just pick up your phone and do it. My parents would be massively offended if we picked up the phone while having dinner with them. 
because we're together as a family. Like, why are we not having a conversation? If you want to be on your phone, why don't you just stay home and be on your phone? Like, oh, okay, you're not wrong. And I guess you get what you tolerate, right? Right. Yeah, we teach what we allow. Yeah. And you call that gal out. Mm-hmm. And not in a, maybe not in a mean spirited way. No. Nope. But just say, hey, why don't you join our conversation? Yep. My, my thing is with people who know me is be where your feet are. And if you're into something that it's it's taking you from you being present where you are, then maybe it's just time to step away. So going back to your question, what was Jesus doing in that dream? Yeah. I'm, I want to answer it this way. I'm not exactly sure, but I know a couple things. One, he wanted me to be aware of the danger of the cloud, the danger of these phones. Now, ladies and gentlemen, ask yourself this question. How many times yesterday or the day before or the past week, on average, did you look at your phone? How many times? I don't know where the average is t- today, but the recent stats I looked at, Dennis, you can correct me if I'm way off, is 125, 125 times a day. Imagine if you didn't look at your phone at all and you opened the Bible 125 times. Imagine if you didn't look at your phone at all and you said Jesus' name out loud 125 times. Imagine if you kept your phone hidden away and you gave your family members 125 hugs that day. You know, Mother Teresa said you need about nine hugs to stay at the norm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So imagine doing something different. Imagine spending 125 minutes in prayer. You see, we have... We're so far off the mark. We don't know how to live in the world. No, we're living in an island. There's a family we take care of at the clinic and their household rules are a family of four, mom, dad, two children, is any time they pass each other in the home, they have to give each other a hug. Just if you're walking down the bathroom to the bathroom and Joey's walking down the hallway, you pass each other, gotta give Joey a hug. Hmm. Yeah. And... It just, it's so neat to think about because at some point they're going to become teenagers and giving hugs is going to be feel weird and awkward. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm looking at my 14 year old son here, soon to be 15 and he's a hugger. But you've taught him that and it's not uncomfortable, unusual, but think how many parents are just into their own cloud their own pillar and are completely oblivious and unaware. I like how you said that. Use it as a metaphor. Yeah. If you're not caught up in God's cloud or God's auspice, you're in another one. Mm -hmm. And whether it's the internet or something else, it's, it's at least a metaphor for something else, but let's go back to the Israelites for a second. Yes. Yes. Because we found this interesting in today's um, liturgy of the hours. What that is, ladies and gentlemen, the priests in the Catholic church are bound to pray four times a day. Morning prayer, uh, morning, uh, afternoon prayer, evening prayer, night prayer. And with that, a fifth is office of readings. Office of readings, usually there's a, I don't know um, how, how many characters, but three, four paragraphs of scripture from somewhere in the Old Testament normally. Sometimes it's in the new though. And then there's usually a letter by one of the saints or one of the popes. Today's reading was all about Aaron. Aaron erected um, this golden calf. So I want to dig in just a little bit here because I think this all ties in. So what happened? Moses pulled all the Israelites away from Egypt and the Pharaoh. Uh, God started sending food, manna. Manna literally means, what is it? So these little, um, they look like oyster crackers. Now, I wasn't there, but there's an actual Protestant preacher. This is so cool. There's a Protestant preacher. He's a, whoa, whoa. He's a Lutheran preacher. And when he preaches, sometimes, um, I think it was Revelations 14, when he opens his Bible, there's some manna in there. I saw this on camera. It's wild. Now, I wasn't there, but on camera, I saw that. And he, they look like these little oyster crackers. And this is what the Israelites lived off of. Well, Moses decides, God asks Moses... Uh, and his team of 72, I think 72 or 70, to go uh, up to the mountain. And so then, so Joshua, Moses, the 70, Aaron stays back. Well, Moses goes up and gets caught up in the cloud. And he's there for 40 days and 40 nights. 
Hey, does that sound familiar? Lent, anybody? Mm. Mm, this comes around. So he's there a long time. Meanwhile, back at the camp with Aaron in charge. Aaron is the mouthpiece of God. They um, they have idle time in their hands. You know, they're probably used to uh, do playing. That, that was a good use of words. Yeah. <laughs> idle time. Yeah, that maybe that was the Holy Spirit because that, that was not intentional. But they have idle time on their hands. And finally they say, We need a God to worship. Moses is dead. He's not coming back. Where is he? He's not. And Aaron, Aaron doesn't fight back at all, does he? Aaron says, Bring me the golden earrings. And he erects this golden calf for them to worship, this idol. Now, what did God just do for them? Miracle after miracle after miracle after he parts a Red Sea. He showers down manna from heaven. And they say, Moses is probably dead. We need a God. Yep. We're not doing good enough on our own. What are your thoughts about this whole you have some insight here? <sighs> this this is just history replaying replaying itself. You know, it's the lack of faith. And yet you can move it backwards or forward in time. Right. You can move this this idol of I'm not getting what I think I need. So I need to fill that space with something else. And okay, go back to Israel. It's time they go and they find a, a golden calf to model up and pray in front of. You can go back in time and see what they did in Egypt. You can go back further in time and see what Solomon did in his golden temples and all of his altars to all his different gods. But let's bring it to today. Okay. Churches have been closed. We're not feeling fed. We're not feeling like we belong to a body of believers. We aren't leaning on each other in our faith. So I need a new God. I, I, need, I need something to fill my time. I can't just sit here in silence. Are you kidding me? Me and my thoughts alone? That's dangerous. I love how you said that. We fill our time with something else. Like you said, if you, if you open the Bible 112 times a day, or you open your phone 112 times a day. Saying yes to one thing is saying no to something else because your your mind can't do two things at one time. I love people when they say, oh, I'm multitasking. No, you're not. You can't multitask. It is impossible to multitask. Now, there are a few people in history who could write and draw with both hands at the same time. Da Vinci was one of them. Um, John Adams, one of the founding fathers, mm -hmm. could do that. But that's not multitasking. That's doing activity. You can only do one thing at one time. You can be making soup, but you're preparing vegetables to put into the soup. It, it's, it's a mind-blowing concept. So when you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to this. I love this analogy with my wife because it makes me feel really good. And it makes her feel really humble. I, uh -oh. when, <laughs> when I said I do to her... I remind her that I said I don't to all the other women of the world. And that makes her feel really special. Well, it's true. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, you are no longer on the uh, availability list. That's right. That's right. It's all over. But so what is at the core of all of this? The human heart is searching for something. We're searching for something. What do we want? We want money. Do we want power? Our wives want security. Security? Do we want pleasure? What is it that we want? And everyone's chasing that one thing to fulfill us. And what do we call that thing most often when it's not the church and it's not God? What do we call that? We all have our demon. We're chasing our demon. That's by design, my friends. Uh-huh. That's not a coincidence. Yeah, and our demon here is our, could be our idol. It's our self-want. Not what God wants, not what, like you said, listening in your dream and hearing God talk to you and giving you clarity and then reminding you 16 years later, 18 years later, hey, I gave you this dream, in, so now ask me the question. When we're focused on something else, it's, it's not what was designed and what's been asked of us by our creator. Ultimately you and I and everybody in the world want one thing, happiness, the pursuit of happiness in the end. That's what we want. You know, Socrates talked about happiness is the long view looking at your life and said, you know, 
I did have some trials and tribulations, but I've had a good life. I eat. I had a good marriage. I have good kids. And I had a noble career. I had a good life. When you look at today's culture, there's so many men, I think, and women who probably look at the long view and say, I don't know if I had a good life. I don't know if I found happiness. And the mistake we made, and and I, I want to be careful here, but we blame others for our misery. You know, uh, our dead dad is still haunting us because we refuse to deal with it. Or maybe it's a mom or maybe it's a grandpa or a grandma or whoever. But in the end, each individual human person, we long for happiness. There's only one source of this happiness. There's only one. Do you um, know what that source is? <laughs> Well, I'm not going to answer that question because you're you're bringing you're bringing this conversation full circle for me, which I absolutely love, because this goes back to what we were talking about when we started this. That my son doesn't know how to read cursive. Well, one of the things we got to look at at the National Archives was the Declaration of Independence, and in that conversation, the the or that document, one of the very beginning lines is, "All men are created equal, and we have the ability to have." Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. <laughs> right. But it doesn't say life, liberty, and happiness. Mm-mm. It says the pursuit of happiness. Because once you're happy, you're not pursuing it anymore. And if you go to back to Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, happiness is the crutch that makes it p- impossible for some people to move beyond just good enough to their great fulfilled potential that God gave them. So if you go to this idol of a, of a, of the internet and you search out your Facebook and you're fulfilled good enough by looking at your friend's social status or who they had suffer with last night or what the, what your grandkids are doing, that's the perfect distraction to keep you from hearing God's small quiet voice of this is what I called you to do today. We are, and I just bring this up because we have a family in our, in our clinic who they're preachers, they're missionary too, in the sense of what they do. They have taken a calling in a new community and they moved in with this family of six, a husband and wife. And within six weeks of being there, the father, husband um, of the family they moved in with, Fell over dead. 36 years old, 34 years old, six kids. So mom's trying to put up the pieces, figure out what she's going to do with her six kids. This patient of ours and their family and their two children are trying to help cover the bases with these six kids. And they're running and gunning and trying to do everything they can. And in the last 10 days, the mother of these six children has been diagnosed with stage three and potentially stage four cancer. And has given a prognosis of three to six months. I mean, you talk about if I was just in my phone and not listening and not hearing where God's asking us to help and to help the people around us, that's how the devil wins. I mean, that's how he wins is making us think we're alone. So let me answer the question. Happiness can only be found in the person of Jesus Christ. And uh, there is no way around that. He is it. He's the guy. He's the person. He's the one. He's the God man. And ladies and gentlemen, I've got family members. I've got friends uh, who are trying to find it. They're, you know, yeah, I, I got a friend who's rebuilding his house. He's a much bigger house. Kids are out of the family. Now they're going to build this huge house. And, and nobody's going to be there. And nobody's going to be there. And do you know what the kids told me? I just want to go to my home. I don't want this new home. It's not my home. It's not where the memories are. Yeah, because there's they have nothing else. They're trying to find it. So they build a bigger house, a new house with all the latest, the greatest. But um, they can't find it because you have an idol, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it's not Billy Idol. No. Um, so, you know. White wedding. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, my wife and I are a fan of the Kevin Costner TV show series, the the Yellowstone. And one of the lines that comes back for me there is the reference to the the main bunkhouse, the cabin where the family yeah. lives. And he is sitting with his daughter at that at that point, and he looks at his daughter and he says, 
my my dad didn't come and build this ranch to to leave it. He built this ranch and he built it big enough and he built this house big enough so his children would never have to leave. And he's referencing back now to his children, his dad's grandchildren are all leaving the ranch. They are not active in part of it and they're not being part of it. And Kevin Costner's character is very lonely. And the irony of that is there's there's the sins of the father play out through the generations and we're all subject to the same pattern. And it's because it is a pattern. It isn't created by us. And you people got to wake up. You got to wake up and see it for what it is and what it will be and what you want it to be because you're in control. Yeah. You may die tomorrow and not know the person of Christ. You may. And that doesn't mean you're going to hell as a, as a Roman Catholic, uh, God gets the last word. We don't know who's in heaven except for canonized saints. We know with certainty they're in heaven. Uh, as a Roman Catholic, you can go straight to heaven. Uh, you, there's another option, which is a part of heaven, which is purgatory. We'll talk about that another time. That's a, it's a section of heaven. It's like the waiting room of Applebee's. You know, you have a couple things to work out with God. That is be- hell. Be- before you, yeah, yeah, before you... <laughs> Before you get into heaven and eat, or like before you get into eat, there's some things you have to work out. But I wanted to read this quote by Blaise Pascal. He says, and I quote, All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. Unquote. We're all trying to get to the same place, aren't we? Well, I hope. What's in your way? Brothers and sisters, if your iPhone is going to cause you Eternal flames, throw the damning thing away. Well, Glenn, I paid a thousand dollars for it. Okay, figure What's your soul worth. Figure out what you're going to do. Then I use it for my job. Okay, figure it out. Put it in the glove box when you go in your car. You know, shut it off. Even though you can't shut them off, there's no way to shut them off unless you take the battery out. But shut it off. Half the time, Dennis, I don't know where my iPhone's at at home because I. I took all your kids are on it. Yeah. Well, no, they're not. Well, I took all the apps that I love. I took them off, and I, and I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll use my iPhone as a as a phone. Wouldn't that be something? Mm-hmm. So I call and I text and I pay a lot of money to do that right now, and I'm not sure. I got to find a different way to call and text, but I think there might be other options. Maybe they'll bring back the BlackBerry. Is your phone causing you eternal harm? I would I would reckon to say that. For myself and our listeners, the overwhelming answer response would be yes over no. It'd be fun if we could do a doodle poll of some sort where our listeners could like chime in and give us their feedback. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. All right. So there has to be some etiquette then. You have to come up with your own iPhone, Google phone, whatever phone you have. Android, yep. Smartphone, dumb phone, whatever you have. You have to come up with a plan. What's your plan? My plan, what I'm doing this Lent, I'm keeping it kind of simple. My plan is I cannot wake up and go grab my phone. I wake up um, and generally get to the couch and start praying right away. Don't even look at the phone. It's been so nice. I have a, a friend of mine that they talked about their phone is their alarm clock. And they're young, they're 22 years old. And he said, have you ever heard of an alarm clock? Well, no, no, my phone is. No, no, no. <laughs> you leave your phone it's charging in the kitchen and you get this little box and it sits on the dresser and it goes, meh, 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 and they're really cheap, like under 30 bucks. And it'll wake you up. And then you can go do your exercise. You can go work out. You can go. You don't have to use the phone because the first thing you do is you click off the phone. And you go, what I miss? What happened in the world that I didn't know about? Whether it's getting on a news app, getting on Facebook, getting on Snapchat. Like, oh, what did my friends do last night when I was sleeping? I missed out on something. 
People, you miss out on so much stuff, you have no idea. <laughs> exactly. You have no idea what happened in Ukraine today. You have no idea what happened in the metro station in in, in London or England. You, you you don't have no idea what happened on the Serengeti. That's such a good point. I'm you, so glad you brought that up. You cannot keep up. You cannot. No. And why are you trying to keep up? For what purpose? Yeah. Your wife's up doing dishes and she needs help and you're on your iPhone or your phone. Makes no sense. What's your takeaway? Be where your feet are. Be where your feet are. And there are some great apps. Like you just, you can't let that phone go. Then download some Bible apps. So download some some apps that put scripture into your life in front of your face. So when it, you get your notifications, it isn't the latest thing happening on Facebook. It's the latest way the word's working in the world. There's some great resources there. My takeaway for all of us is that the idols are everywhere. Whether you are an NFL fan, yeah, because I, I do fantasy football. I love it. But I've got guys I play with that can rattle off the stats for every player for the last 20 years, but they can't tell you what happened in Kings 2 verse 7. I'm glad you know your stats, but that isn't where I'm spending my eternal time. Now it's basketball season coming up on the NCAA tournament. March Madness. How about we had March Madness for God? How about we had March Madness for Jesus? And you know what? Give me the 64 greatest things that happened in the Bible and bracket them out to the one greatest thing that happened in the Bible. Now, wouldn't that be a cool bracket? Awesome. So that's my takeaway. So as the Bible says, if your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. Some people don't take that literally. What if you did? If your phone is causing you to sin, shut it off. If your computer is causing you to sin, shut it off. I mean, are you really willing to risk missing eternal life because... You think this is fulfilling you? Everybody, almost everybody has an idol they deal with. Figure it out. Ask the Lord to reveal to you what is the idol that you're dealing with and how to get out of it. And you won't see it. Ask the people around you. What what do you always see me doing? What am I always doing? When I'm hanging out with you, am I on my phone? Am I reading a magazine? Am I watching TV? Am I playing my Xbox? Am I... Ask your friends around you. They'll help you. And there's nothing better than a group of Christians getting together and protecting each other. Well, we got a big amen there. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening to the Glenn Gower Podcast. And may God strengthen the bars of your gates.